Welcome to concept one of unit two, and we are going to be talking about atomic theory and structure. So first, let's revisit the definition of the atom. An atom is the smallest unit of an element that still has the properties of that element. So if you remember from our first unit, an element is a pure substance that cannot be broken down into anything simpler or more stable. And I think the best way for me to remember the difference between an element and an atom and a compound is to look at it in an example. So for example, water is H2O. That is a compound. It's a chemical compound. And it is made when two atoms of the element hydrogen and one atom of the element oxygen are chemically combined to each other. So again, an atom is the smallest unit of an element. And that word atom is coming from a Greek word atomus, which means indivisible. And Democritus was a philosopher in around 400 BC. He was the one who kind of was the first to coin this term. And what we've learned since then is that the atom is actually divisible. But we'll get into that a little bit later. But that's where that term atom comes, this idea that it's indivisible, that it represents fully the identity of an element. It has all of the properties of an element. And atomic theory is the idea that matter is made up of fundamental particles called atoms. And there are a lot of different people that contributed to our current understanding of atomic theory and of the structure of an atom. And so what we are gonna be doing in class is we are going to pause here and we are gonna take some time to learn about all of the different people that contributed to what we know now about the atom. I'm not gonna do notes on this, but that is gonna be really important what we learn through this atomic theory timeline model activity. So we're gonna do that in class, but for the sake of the video, we're gonna kinda of keep pushing through and we're gonna do a summary of what we know today to be true about the structure of of an atom. Okay, so first is the subatomic particles. So like I said, Democritus had it a little bit wrong in that the atom is actually divisible. Now, each of these pieces of an atom do not retain all the properties of an element. So the, a proton that would make up an atom of hydrogen does not have all of the properties of an atom of the element hydrogen. It's different, but we can still break it down further. And so these are the three particles that make up an atom. There's the proton. Now, for abbreviations, there are symbols for each of these that you can use from now on in your notes, and you need to be able to recognize these. And for proton, it's a P with a positive as a superscript up here. Okay, so that's a proton. It is the positive particle that's in the nucleus or the center part of the atom, which we'll talk more about the nucleus in a little bit. So it's the positive particle there. Now, I added this little coral word to the notes because this is something that I like to try to remember. And that's what each of these particles kind of tells me about these subatomical part what these subatomical particles tell me about an atom. Okay, so for example, for the proton, the number of protons that an atom has is going to reveal the identity of the element th that atom is. Okay, so protons tell us identity. Now, another subatomic particle is the neutron, and its symbol is N with a zero because it has no charge. It is neutral. It is not positive or negative, and it is also in the nucleus with protons. And what the neutron tells us about an atom is it really informs us on the atom's mass because atoms of the same element, so two different carbon atoms, can have different masses based on the number of neutrons that they have. Their proton number isn't changing because the proton is what makes them carbon, but their mass can be different based on how many neutrons they have. And that's something we'll get into a little bit later. Those are called isotopes. So we're gonna get to that. And then the third subatomic particle is electrons. And their abbreviation is E minus because they have a negative charge. An electron is the negative particle and it is outside of the nucleus. It is in the electron cloud. That's the space that's surrounding the nucleus of an atom. And the electrons really tell us about the bonding behavior of an atom and specifically the outermost electrons. Those are really, really impacting the chemical and physical properties of the element, but especially how it's going to bond with other atoms of different elements. And we're going to be talking about that a lot in future units. So 
don't let these kind of pinkish coral words scare you. You really need to know these definitions. Most importantly, we'll kind of get to these other things as we go, but that's something that really helps me. What can these different subatomic particles tell me about an atom? They can tell me the identity, the mass, and really help inform what I know about their bonding behavior, which we'll get to. But now let's talk about those two parts of the structure of the atom that I've already mentioned. So we have the nucleus, which is in the center, and then the electron cloud, which is in the surrounding space. Okay, so first, the nucleus. It is the dense center of the atom. It is very, very compact, and that's why I use that word dense. It is made of the protons and the neutrons. And because neutrons have no charge and protons have a positive charge, that makes the center of the atom, the nucleus, have an overall positive charge because of those protons. Now we say that the nucleus is where the mass of the atom is located. And that is because protons and neutrons are two thousand times more massive than electrons are and so this is much 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 denser much more massive than the rest of the space of the atom which we'll get to okay so the other part we need to talk about is that electron cloud this is the space surrounding the nucleus and it is filled with all of those electrons and those electrons are in constant motion. They have so much energy. They're going crazy. And we would say that this electron cloud does have a negative charge because of those electrons out there. We also say that this is where the volume of the atom is located because this is where most of the atom space that it's taking up is. It's in this electron cloud. So that's where the volume is. This is where the mass is in the center, but the volume, the space taken up by the atom is in that electron cloud. Now, more about the electron cloud. It is broken down into regions of space, which are known as shells or energy levels. So you can use those interchangeably. Electrons in different shells have varying energy levels. So the shell closest to the nucleus, it holds the least amount of electrons. It only can hold a maximum of two electrons. And those have the lowest energy. Whereas electrons in the shells further from the nucleus have more energy with the ones in the outermost energy level having the most energy. And those are called valence electrons. Valence electrons are so important, like I said, when it comes to bonding behavior. And so we're gonna talk about this a ton in future units as we talk about the formation of compounds. But I want you to get familiar with this now. And we'll talk a lot more about the arrangement of the electron cloud and kind of what that looks like in unit three, which is the electron. So unit three is gonna be all about electrons in a lot more detail but this is what you need to know for now in terms of the structure of the atom. So what holds all of this together? How is it held together? There are a couple forces that do this. First, there is an electromagnetic force. So anything that is electrically charged is going to have some sort of attraction to things that are different from it and repulsion from things that are like it. So opposites attract, like charges repel. And because we have electrically charged particles in the atom, the positive protons are attracted to the negative electrons. And there's an attraction there. But there's also a repulsion between the protons with each other and the electrons with each other. Okay, so that plays a lot of different roles. So first, there's a, that strong attraction between the nucleus, which is positive, and the electron cloud as a whole, which is negative. So that's what's really holding it together. But one of the reasons why the electron, electron cloud has so much volume is because those electrons are repelling each other because those negative charges don't want to be near each other. So they have all this energy, plus they want, don't want to be near each other. So they are bouncing off the walls to stay away from each other. There's also, though, a repulsive force between the protons in the nucleus. So you're like, how then does the nucleus even stay together? Well, it's able to kind of overcome that repulsive force because of something called the strong nuclear force. So this is another force that's at play. So protons and neutrons, you can see in this picture, they can be further broken down into quarks. Okay, so look at this picture. You have a picture of matter, which is represented by water. That water is broken down into molecules, which would be like H2O. 
if you zoom into that, here's the structure of an atom, then you can zoom in and even on the nucleus, zoom in on a proton and neutron, and those can get broken down even further into these quarks. So you don't need to know a lot about the structure for the scope of this class, but do know that protons and neutrons are made of quarks and quarks have a strong attraction. So that's what is able to hold the nucleus together. Despite the repulsion that's happening between the protons and the nucleus, those quarks are what's holding the nucleus together. And this only works, this strong nuclear force can only happen over a really short distance. So the larger the nucleus, meaning the more protons and the more neutrons that are gonna be in the nucleus that will make it bigger, the weaker that nuclear force is that is being held together and that's holding the nucleus together. Okay, so that gets weaker. That force of attraction between the quarks gets weaker as the nucleus gets bigger. So if an atom has more than, you know, 80, 82, 83 protons, the electromagnetic repulsion of those protons becomes greater than that strong nuclear force of attraction. And that's what makes the nucleus of an atom unstable, which we refer to as being radioactive. And that's what makes a nucleus able to break down and not be held together. And that's where we get into this entire field of nuclear chemistry, which we will do an overview of in concept three. So you don't need to know all about that just yet, but just know this strong nuclear force that's between the quarks is what overcomes that electromagnetic force of the repulsion of the protons, and that's what keeps the nucleus together. And the entire atom is held together by that electromagnetic force between the positive nucleus and the negative electron cloud. There's also a weaker nuclear force at work, but we're not gonna get into that in the scope of this class. So for now, that's all you need to know. And we're gonna do a little practice with this in our packet so we can kind of get acquainted more with the structure of the atom before we dive into deeper detail on how this kind of connects and relates to the periodic table, which is gonna be a tool and a lifeline for you in this unit. So stay tuned. <laughs> 